speaking today, uh, my diamond title is The Savior Dies. The Savior Dies. And uh, if you remember, on Sunday, my message was The Savior Comes. And today, I do with The Savior Dies. And on Sunday, I'll be teaching on The Savior Lives. Uh, because this season is all about the Lord Jesus Christ. He came, he died, and he's alive. So, the idea of uh, a savior coming to redeem mankind is, is very much present in the Old Testament. If you read the Old Testament, uh, you see right from the book of Genesis, God uh, promised a redeemer uh, who would come and redeem mankind from sin uh, after the sin of Adam and Eve. So the idea is there, and you see it in Genesis. You see a lot of it in, in the book of Exodus, especially through the sacrifices that are made. And the book of Leviticus is so rich, uh, indicating atonement and, and redemption and what God is going to do. But where we begin to hear it uh, loudest is through the prophets uh, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah, uh, Daniel, all of them prophesying that somebody is going to come, somebody is going to come, a redeemer is going to come, he'll be a servant, he'll be a king, uh, he'll be from the house of David and all of that, so many prophecies being declared. But pretty soon, the, the Jews uh, who had these prophecies and recorded them uh, began to form a picture of who this person would be and where he would come from. And uh, because much of their history, they had been under oppression. Uh, first, they became, they were oppressed in Egypt, and then they went to Babylon, and uh, later on, and they were under oppression, and then the Persians took over, and, and throughout, and and later, by the time Jesus is coming, they are under Roman tyranny. So the Jews, when they envisaged this Redeemer, had forgotten about Adam and the sin of Adam and the sins of mankind and all of that. They now thought this Redeemer, this Savior, this person, this King who is coming is going to throw off the Romans, throw off the oppressors and set them free. So they conceptualize a political savior, a political redeemer. And they, they, they conceptualize him as somebody who will come and fight. One of the thoughts that was very difficult and it was far away from their minds was that this person would die. They, they, they couldn't get it because in their mind, how are you going to overcome the Romans when you die? And if you remember when Jesus talked about his death, his disciples said, no, 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 sir, no, sir. It's not part of the plan. The Redeemer must not die. Uh, and, and, and when Jesus talked about the fact that he's going to die, even Peter rebuked him and says, I rebuke you, Jesus, in the name of Jesus. You cannot die because the Savior, the Redeemer, must redeem us and death shouldn't be part of the plan. So the idea of a dying savior was a difficult idea for the disciples. But that is what the prophets had declared. And we go to the book of Isaiah chapter 53, uh, which speaks very copiously about the coming redeemer from verse 11. Isaiah chapter 53 from verse 11 and 12. And you see it clear that this redeemer was going to die. He says, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many 
and made intercession for their transgressors. So, two things uh, that this portion of Isaiah 53 highlights. One is that the Savior shall bear sins and iniquities. The Savior will be a sin bearer and an iniquity bearer. In other words, uh, although the people were thinking of somebody who will come and free them from Romans and from, um, from bondage and, 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 and give them their own nation, God says, well, that's what you want, but the Savior is coming to be a sin bearer, one who bears iniquities, one who carries transgressions. All we have gone astray, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So it's quite clear that what God was talking about was very different from what the people were hoping for. So that's the first thing, that the Savior shall bear sins and iniquity. The second thing you find in the passage is that the Savior shall pour out his soul unto death. He shall pour out his soul unto death. And that's a very interesting language pour out his soul unto death. They didn't just say he would die, but in the process of dying, he would pour out his soul. In the Jewish culture, the soul or the life of a thing is in its blood. So when they hear, pour out your soul unto death, it means you're going to pour out your blood until you die. So the passage clearly says the Savior is going to die, but the death he was going to die was going to be a result of bleeding. He's going to pour out his soul. He's going to shed his blood. Blood was going to ooze out of him, and then he would die. So in God's promise of a Messiah is a sin bearer and one who would die. It was necessary for the sin to die, uh, for the Savior to die. Although the people didn't want him to die, they wanted a great general, a great army commander. God says, I'm giving you a sin bearer and a dying Savior. The Savior would die. And so when we read the Gospels and we read about the fulfillment of this prophecy, the dying of the Savior, we must not, although there are all kinds of things in play, uh, Judas' own greed, the, the, the jealousy and the envy of the Pharisees and the scribes and, and, the, and, and, and the chief priests, all of that is playing out the Romans and their insecurity, all of that is playing out. But all of that is because God said the Savior will die. So they are not making it happen. God is the one who is making it happen. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, the scripture says. It was in God's plan that this would be the way the Savior dies. So let's go to the New Testament and read the account of the Savior dying. John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 20 to 30. John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 20, 28, sorry, to 30. Did I say 20? I think so. 28 to 30. 20 to 30 is too long. 28 to 30. John 19, 28 to 30. This is John's account of the final moment of the life of Jesus. After this, and when he said after this, this is when Jesus had said to uh, John, behold your mother and, 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 and vice versa to Mary, uh, behold your son. He says, after this, Jesus knowing, note the language, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing down his head, he gave up 
his spirit. Now, there's a lot to uh, take from this verse. Um, I mean, so many interesting things happen in this uh, passage alone. The hyssop uh, plant that is used to present a sponge full of uh, some uh, wine for him um, is, is significant because under the old covenant on the day of the Passover, uh, when the blood of the lamb was shed, they would take uh, from the hyssop plant and, and apply the blood uh, on their lintel. So there is a play of several things, fulfillment of many prophecies happening in this one verse uh, or these few verses uh, alone. But I want to relate, uh, focus on three related words that are all used in this passage to describe the final moments of Jesus Christ. All the three words have the same Greek root word or the same Greek lemma. And that word uh, in the Greek is teleos, teleos or teleo. It means to carry out something to a successful end. To carry out something to a successful end. And this root word is used in different forms to give meaning to what Jesus did on the cross. Now, when I say it's a Greek root word, it, you know, it's like in English. If you have the word go, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a verb, go. Uh, but different words come out of go. You can say going, and you can say gone, and you can say goes. You can even say went, comes out of go. So, so in the Greek, it's the same way. So you can have one root word, and un, around that word, different forms of it are used in a sentence. So uh, the point I'm making is that this word, teleo, is, is a root word, and it is used in different forms. If you read the English, you may not see that way, but in the Greek, you will see it is the same word being used three times uh, in, in the passage. It just tells you that what Jesus is doing on the cross is related to this word, teleo, bringing something to a successful end or conclusion. So everything Jesus is doing, he's concluding something. He is bringing something to a successful end. So I'm going to take you to the three times that this root word is used in different forms and what they say to us about what Jesus is doing on the cross. The first time we encounter this root word is in verse number 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, the word accomplished, in the Greek is tetelestai. It comes from the same teleo. Jesus knew that all things were now accomplished. All things were now accomplished. So there is a moment in Jesus' life on the cross where he gets to the realization, now is the time. Everything is set. So that gives you the impression something has been happening and now it has come to a moment where there has to be execution, fulfillment of a transaction. Accomplished. Jesus knew that all things were accomplished. And what does it tell us uh, about what Jesus is doing? It means that Jesus left nothing undone for our salvation. Before Jesus died, he knew that there was nothing outstanding to be done. There's nothing else to be done. So it's, it's not as if in, in trying to save us, he did some things and then he later said, oh, I should have done that before I died. <laughs> Are you getting me? You know, oh, wow. Why did I miss that? Oh, now, 
Oh, the salvation is not complete. No, the Bible says he knew now all things are complete. There is nothing outstanding in the process for our salvation. There is nothing left undone. He had completed everything. And when he knew he had completed everything, it, he said, I thirst. But I'll get to that later. So that's the first time uh, in the passage that that Greek word is constructed in this way. As tetelestai, accomplished. He has done everything necessary to be done for our salvation. That means that in, in, in the end when he saves us, there is no bit that has not been done in our salvation. Everything necessary for our salvation has been accomplished. That's the first time. The second time the word is used, it's used in another form. And it's in the same verse, it say, and it is used as fulfilled. The second part of verse 28, it says that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus said, I thirst. Teleo te. Or te. Fulfilled. That the scripture might be fulfilled. So, you know, what, what amazes me as I, as I ponder the life of Jesus, you are on the cross, your blood is being drained, thorns on your head, crown of thorns on your head, people are mocking you on the left and right and in front. You are dying and you are thinking of fulfilling scripture. I mean, he, he's present-minded. He's not absent-minded. He's not saying, oh, I don't know what is going on. Oh, let me just get on with this and die. No, at a certain point, he knew. According to scripture, I must say, I thirst. Are you, are you getting what is happening? Jesus is very particular about what he's doing for our salvation because he doesn't want any bit of our salvation to be outstanding so that after he has finished, we can come and say, oh, he died, but he didn't die for that. Oh, he died, but he didn't solve that problem. Oh, he died, but this one is outstanding. No! He's getting the job done perfectly. <laughs> to be fulfilled. Same word. What does it tell us? That Jesus did things exactly as the scripture promised they would be done. Before Jesus was born, throughout the Old Testament, the promises concerning the Messiah were over 300 promises. As a matter of fact, at some time, the Jews, the Jews felt it was impossible for any one person to be born who will fulfill all the 300. From who his mother will be, to what village he will be born in, to, to, to all kinds of things. A star appearing, every one of them has been declared. The fact that that person will be taken to Africa and brought back. Out of Egypt, I've called my son. All of this. So they knew all these pieces of scripture, which they call them the messianic scriptures. But if you look at it, how can one person fulfill all these? Even to his death and saying, I thirst. What if he forgets at the last minute? Are you following me? At the last minute, Jesus would say, hey, this thing is so painful. Uh, Charlie, uh, you know, I'm gone. I'm out, baby. I'm out. As the young people would say. But even to the point of saying, I thirst, he remembered and he said it because he had to do everything to fulfill the scriptures so there will be nothing outstanding to be fulfilled that has not been fulfilled. And what that does is to help us to understand our salvation and the preciousness of our salvation. Our salvation is not an accident. It's not like an afterthought. 
It, it, I mean, this is an exact work going on. He did things exactly as the scripture promised them, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Same word used. He's successfully accomplishing what must be accomplished. And the final third time that the word is used is in verse 30. So when Jesus had received the saw wine, he said, it is finished. And that word comes from the same teleo. And this time it's constructed tetelestai. It is finished. It is finished. It's done. It's settled. Now you have to think, Jesus didn't say, I am finished. If he said, I am finished, we'll have a theological conference on what did he mean by I am finished. Did he mean it was the end of him? Did he mean as in, in Ghana now, if he say I'm finished, it means somebody has finished you. <laughs> it means that you know, somebody more powerful has just done you in. He didn't say they are finished. Because if you say they are finished, you mean your enemies are gone. You know, because uh, many of us, that we would have wished that he said they are finished. Then you can also, when people attack you, say you, you are finished. As Jesus said, you are finished. But he said, it is finished. What is finished? Not him, not them, not the people around him, but the assignment that he came to accomplish. It is finished. What was his assignment? To carry the burdens of mankind. To liberate us from sin. To pay the price from sin. First initiated from the sin of Adam and Eve. And accumulated. Carried all of it. And not only backdated. But also carried forward. Carry forward. Salary advance. Your sin. My sin. The sin of your children. The sin of the people who will be born 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. He, he dealt with sin past, present, forward. And he said, it is finished. That word, if you use it in that sense, it means it is settled. Account settled, paid for. So what does it mean? It means Jesus completely settled all the terms for our salvation. He settled all the terms. It's like somebody who signs a contract and there are probably about, if you, if for example, you are going to build a very big uh, a project, a bridge or something very uh, massive. Regulators have code. How many inches you must dig, what kind of iron you must use, what kind of nails you must use, what kind of steel you must use, what kind of concrete, the, the kind of mixture of the concrete, how much, what, all of that. And, and it's all of that, how many floors you can build and how it should be arranged and, and, and how the electrical cables should be made. And you have so many items to be fulfilled. And if your, the building inspector comes or the, or the inspector of the project comes, you have to ensure that every part of the code is finished. That's, then your building can get a permit for occupancy, although in Ghana we can occupy without permit. But I'm just saying, in the ideal state, that's how it's supposed to be. 
we all occupy without permit. <laughs> The permit seeker himself is not even coming to look for your permit. He's coming to look for Achaya. You know. <laughs> oh Lord, deliver Africa. Deliver us, oh Lord. <laughs> but all things being equal, that's how it's supposed to be. Every part has been done. So when Jesus says it is finished. He just meant everything that the code was expecting. Every one of the types and shadows of the Old Testament, over 600 of them. Everything that is required, every prophecy, over 300 of them. And he says, done. Done. And it is only after that that he dies. And I like how the Bible puts it. You know, you, you just see control in all of this. After this, he bowed down his head and gave up his spirit. They didn't take it away from him. He just said, it is finished. Let's go. And he's out. He didn't die until every bit had been accomplished. So today, today when you sit here and you say, I have received Christ and what he did for me, you're not just mouthing phrases. You are receiving a fully completed product called salvation. He dealt with witches and wizards also in the code that in his death he has to break the power of Satan. So you cannot say the witches in your family are so powerful. They are so powerful. Pastor, you don't know. They are so powerful. Well, I know they are powerful. But the code has been satisfied. And the regulator in heaven has accepted it. And he said, this which has been done is sufficient and efficient for sins, for salvation, for deliverance, for victory over every oppressive force in this world. It is done. It is done. And 2,000 years ago, on that cross, it was done and it has never been undone since it was done we don't we don't celebrate good friday to re litigate what christ did we don't re litigate it it's done the Supreme Court of Heaven has settled it in a unanimous decision. There can be no appeal, there can be no repeal, there can be no review of that case. It is settled. For all eternity, for all people, in all places, at all times, in all circumstances, in all situations, on that cross, it was sufficiently and successfully done. And today, all you do is to accept it, believe it, declare it with your mouth, and enforce it in your life. So the Bible then tells us 
the way to receive this for salvation. It says, if you shall believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe that God raised him from the dead, and you declare it with your mouth, you shall be saved. You say, well, it's, it's too easy. Yes, it's easy. Because the hard work was done by somebody else. He did all the hard work. And he presented us and says, done. All you need to do is sign your name on it and it's yours. Now, some people want to go and do it all by themselves. That's up to you. You want to go to the cross? That's up to you. Today in South America, a lot of people in remembering Good Friday are going to go to be nailed on a cross. That's nice for tourist attraction if you feel that nails in your hand. God bless you. I'm not going to protest that. Go and nail yourself for tourism. But you don't need to nail yourself. You don't need to whip yourself. You don't need to destroy yourself because he paid it all. He accomplished everything that was necessary for our salvation. So this morning, if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we have different words we call that. Sometimes we say the person is saved. Sometimes we say a person has received Jesus as his Lord and personal Savior. We say the person is born again. It all talks about the same thing, that you've come to the point in your life where you say, I now receive the full benefit of what Christ did for me. And the Bible says it will be given to you. In the scripture we read, Jesus promised a thief instant salvation. A thief on the cross. Nobody can do that. Instant salvation. You didn't say, well, you know, you've stolen all your life. You've been a rebellion. You've, you've cheated people. You're a crook. Now finally you're about to die. You want salvation. You, hey, that's not how it works. So that's not how it works. <laughs> you have to change your life. You have to go, 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 and go, go and go and return all the things you stole from the people. The guy says, listen, I'm nailed here. I can't go and return anything. But I believe you are doing this for me. And that's all. He signed his name. The first person to sign his name on the document. I believe what you're doing is for me. Jesus says it's done. So we're going to bow our heads for a moment in prayer. And if you are here and you say, Pastor, I want to receive Jesus into my heart. I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I want this gift of salvation to be mine. And I want to live my life for him. All I'm going to ask you is just show your readiness. Show that you are ready for it. And the way to show you're ready is just to lift up your hand. Lift up your hand wherever you are. You say, I want to be born again. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want salvation. I want to start a new life with Christ. Just let your hand be up. Just let your hand be up. There will be people who would see you. Let it be up so that your hand can be detected. And the ushers will give you a form to fill. And for those of you who lifted up your hand, I'm going to ask you to put your hand on your heart as we all pray this prayer together. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus Christ to die for me, to finish the work for my salvation. And today, I receive his gift of salvation into my heart. Lord Jesus, be my savior. Change my life. Make me a brand new person. I believe you died for me. I believe God raised you from the dead. And I believe you are eternally the savior of this world. I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Amen.